of Business, the Office of Economic Development of the City of San Jose. is excited to welcome you all and to launch a um, quick overview of ways in which you can market your business that maybe you haven't thought of and that might not cost you as much money as you think. So next slide. The team that we have today for our webinar is uh, me, Elizabeth Handler, and our members today from the city of San Jose are Melina Iglesia, Emily Lipoma, Mark Vic Farley, and I don't see Nathan, but I think he's joining us, Nathan Donato Weinstein. We're from the business development part of uh, Office of Economic Development, working very hard since March of last year to focus on the needs of the small businesses in San Jose and this webinar series as part of what we have put together. Um, our special guest today to talk about marketing is David Ocampo, who is the principal and creative director of Milagro Marketing, uh, one of the preeminent multicultural communications uh, firms in California and his his expertise covers pretty much every aspect of um, positive communications, including advertising campaigns, um, public relations, website development, design, uh, you name it, you'll find it. I'm gonna put the uh, website in the chat so you can visit his site and see the cool work that he's done. And we're really excited to to, to welcome David today and to hear from him. But we've got a little bit of housekeeping first before we, we hear from David. Next slide. Okay, first is our, our disclaimer. Um, we make every effort as a city with our partners and our interpreters to be as correct and full and um, perfect the information as possible um, but we are not liable for being misinterpreted, incomplete, old or inaccurate information presented in good faith. So please always consult with a legal or financial advisor on critical issues affecting your business. Next slide. We're doing this webinar with live interpretation services happening simultaneously. So look at the bottom of your screen if you would like to hear this interpreted into either Spanish, Vietnamese, or Mandarin. Look for the globe sign, a little round globe with crisscrosses on it on the bottom right hand of your screen. And um, check on that and then choose the language that you would like to hear the session in. We are recording this session and the all, all different language versions will be posted to the YouTube channel of our website. So if you miss something and you want to go back, you can always access that. Next. If you have questions as we go along, put it in the Q&A section down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see Q&A. There's also a chat option, which you could also put questions in if you like, but we're also going to be sharing information in the chat. For instance, I'll put the Milagro Marketing um, Email, uh, website address there. So you'll see website addresses and other things that might be helpful to you in the chat as we go along. We're going to do an, a survey after the webinar and we'll email that to you. Um, and you should keep your eye out for our next webinar, which is on Thursday, August 18th. And Vic will be leading us in a discussion of updates on state funding opportunities more opportunities for finding funds from the state to help your business. Next slide. All right, so we're really excited to um, have you here and I'm gonna turn it over to David. All right, thank you. Can everybody uh, hear me? Yes. Awesome, great. Um, I actually wanted to ask everyone here that's here, if you don't mind in the Q&A, could you let me know what kind of businesses you run? Uh, just the general category. I want to make sure that what we're doing here is, uh, you know, right on target. That would definitely help me. I'm hoping to see some of those quickly. Great. Um, 
but let's get let's get rolling. So my name is David Ocampo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk a little bit one about my business, which is always fun for me. I can always talk about my business for days. Two about the industry of advertising. What we do is advertising agencies. Um, you know, you always hear the terms marketing and communications. Um, now, most recently, you're going to hear content creators, which tends to be another kind of term that's loosely used. They all really honestly kind of go up towards advertising because marketing is the data marketing is the information that's collected but somebody has to interpret it and somebody has to then make sense of it and then uh, have that what's called an aha moment and develop this amazing creative that has to go out um, to uh, the public um, and so i'm seeing performing arts dance studio uh, remodeling as a few um just trying to See, once I'm in slide, it's hard to see the rest. Um, Elizabeth, can you see the others? Because I can't seem to scroll on the rest. There's only ones I can get to right now. Your microphone's off, I think. Home-based travel. And that's the one that's been put in for now. It's home-based travel okay. business. Okay, that's what I'm missing. Okay, cool. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do today um, is to actually you know, because I could talk about all the elements of advertising with you guys, and it's going to seem uh, like a lot. Um, uh, but I kind of want to leave you guys with something that maybe you can use, uh, and that was uh, how to put together an advertising budget. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that's going to be primary in, in the deck that I'm presenting to you guys today. So back to me. My name is David Ocampo. Um, I'm originally from uh, Salinas, California, uh, born and raised there. Um, I am the principal and creative director of Milagro Marketing, um, which I started over 20 some odd years ago. Um, I put the link there, um, but I know that Elizabeth and them will put it also in the chat, the www.milagromarketing.com, where you can see some of the work that we do. Um, we are an advertising agency uh, that's been in San Jose for quite a while. Um, I'm also a professor at San Jose State and I teach uh, intro to advertising and I teach a copywriting class. Um, but I like to always start off stuff with why advertising? Um, and, or why did I get into advertising? Um, one of the reasons that Milagro, which is Spanish for miracle, but miracle marketing doesn't sound cool. Milagro marketing is much cooler. Um, was the fact that as I grew up, um, when I was 16, I was um, a technical engineer for Spanish International Network in Canal 35 or Channel 35. Um, and my job was really interesting. I would get there after school around 3.34. I'd work till midnight, two, three times a week. Um, I'd get to do my homework there, so it was cool. Uh, but my job was just to uh, switch the feed out from national to local. So national meant that uh, there was television spots in between the telenovelas or the soap operas. Um, and the national feed back then, this is in the 80s, was done by big old, basically VHSs, but, but larger ones, these huge ones that, that, that uh, were better quality for, for broadcast. Um, and these tapes would come to our office with all the local commercials. So let's say at the second segment of the first telenovela, there's a commercial for a car company in Los Angeles uh, that's in the feed. Well, of course, Salinas didn't care about that because that wasn't relevant. So I would then run a furniture store or I would run um, a local grocery store or a national spot um, that was just focused on the Bay Area. Um, but what I noticed in doing that in working for that TV station was that all of the national commercials were not with Latino faces. Um, so you would basically have um, the all-American family, um, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, uh, one, 1. 1.5 kids and a dog jumping into a Ford car and saying, and you'd have a dub over, a voiceover in Spanish saying, you know, this is the car you want. But I knew, looking at my parents and myself, that when I saw those commercials, we just weren't present. And I thought, this just can't seem right. Can't you create a commercial with Latino faces in it? Can't you just have our families in there? What's so difficult about that? I could probably put that together myself and felt I could even do it in high school. So 
the fact that I thought we were absent was one of the driving forces behind why I wanted to get into advertising and why I wanted it to be a Latino agency with the ability to reach, speak, and communicate all the great things that we're about to, to an audience that is relevant to the product. Um, I watched too much TV as a youth, the 80s. Remember, um, I was really, I was born in the 60s. So think about it. My generation was the first, Generation X was the first generation to grow up on television as kids. Kind of like how we look at the millennials or post-millennials today who, are grown, who have grown up with computers in hand versus others who maybe got it later in life. Um, and one of the shows I used to watch was uh, Bewitched. Um, and so it's interesting enough, there was a character there named Dar Darren Stevens who was the advertising guy. And I used to be, I used to marvel at watching him um, come up with ideas and get paid for it. And I was like, you know, this guy sits there. And actually I think in the, in the sitcom, the, 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 um, the wife who was the witch or the, had the special powers actually came up with a lot of the creative for him, but it was magical. In any case, I thought, it, wouldn't that be an amazing job? You get paid to develop ideas. You get paid for your ideas. And I thought that's, that's for me. Um, I thought I could do a better job than what I saw on television after I saw those commercials, which were just dubbed over. And at one point I was really frustrated because it was Lucky's national commercial, which tried. And Lucky's had a, a spot early on in the eighties in which they had a character who was a revolutionary Mexican uh, girl. She had a gun belt and it was a cartoon. Um, and she was, had a rifle and her gun belt. And she said, Viva Lucky's, Viva La Revolucion. And that was the, the commercial. And I would sit there going, wow, finally they've created something with us in mind and yet they just failed. And I thought, is this really the best they could do? Um, not that the revolution wasn't important to folks of Mexican descent, it's, it's, it's pivotal in our history, but I didn't think it was necessary to sell luckies in that manner. I figured there was better ways to do it. I love creative problem solving um, and that, is one of the reasons why I enjoy doing this. Um, I read a book uh, called The Burden of Support by David Hayes Bautista. I would recommend anybody reading that. And what that did for me was it made me understand one thing. He had something in the book called Age Ethnic Stratified Society. And this is in the 80s when he was writing about this, he, really from a health field, he was talking about this idea that the millennials or post millennials that we that are here now today would be the largest demographic that rivaled the baby boomers so if you know anything about the baby boomers right they're the audience that changed the world I and mean, that's you know that's apple computers that's you know eight you know hp that's all these companies uh microsoft that came about as a result of, of baby boomers um who some didn't even do it traditionally right i mean half these guys dropped out of school and became famous and rich and did their thing. But David Hayes Bautista was talking about how this new audience, this age ethnic stratified society was gonna be the same exact size, if not larger than the baby boomers, but they were gonna be ethnically different. And one of the largest uh, demographics within that audience were Latinas. And so if you look now, today, you go to any university and you look at the the Hispanic numbers on those campuses, a majority of them are female. And so I thought to myself, well, if this is the case, and, and his, from his health perspective, he was worried about what did that mean for longevity, for society, for health, um, what did it mean for caregivers? Um, he, was, he was doing that, but I took the data and said, well, what does that mean for advertising and marketing? Does that mean there'll be a shift? Does that mean that that, that audience will exist? Because up to that point, if you talked about Hispanic market, you, you spoke about them as if they were a niche market. And I looked at the numbers and realized, well, Apple computers at that time had a whole department that marketed towards Canada. And yet they didn't have one for Hispanic market. And yet the Hispanic, the US Hispanic market was the same size as the Canadian market. And it was like, whoa, how does this not make sense? Um, so I really got excited by that and thought, well, in 20 years, when this is the reality or more further down the road, not 20 longer, sorry, I'm not doing good math here. Um, you know, maybe an agency that focused on that demographic could be successful. 
and and maybe then I can help um, dissuade the stereotypes and put our images front and center. I also read a book called the Milagro Beanfield War, which is a movie uh, which I was just totally loved. It was a great reading. And of course, that's how Milagro marketing was born. So um, who are we? We're at Milagro Marketing, our cultural content creators. We produce advertising campaigns that are culturally relevant, socially conscious. We provide clients with an opportunity to reach, speak, and embrace Latinos through marketing and communications. That's what I do. Um, we have campaigns that are managed by smart people. We have creativity that empowers your brand. And this is some of what we call our unique selling propositions. We have content that connects to an audience. We have advertising or create advertising that is revolutionary. Um, unique selling proposition is an idea that we always talk to with businesses um, where you've got to figure out, and it's a really hard thing, um, what is your unique selling proposition? If you sold tequila, what tequila makes you better than the rest? Because there's hundreds of bottles of different tequilas, right? Um, but what makes yours unique? And that's not an easy thing to discover um, because you may look at your business and say, well, I, I, I have a hair salon, what makes me unique? Um, one of my clients, Chacho's Mexican restaurant in downtown San Jose, which is actually no longer there because they burned down, but they did a reopen one in Morgan Hill. Um, you know, he, he's Mexican food, <laughs> right? I mean, what's unique about that, you know? Um, well, in his particular case, he took on this very artistic vibe. He was one of the first people to um, use pink as his, as his brand element. Um, and he uh, basically single-handedly created the micheladas, um, the, um, the mangoladas. Um, and it wasn't that they didn't exist, but that he's the one to build, the, he, he made this little hook hooked on the side of the bottle so that you could do those little those little tiny ones, the ones you get in the airplanes, right? When you want to drink because you're stressed, right? And you kind of hung on the side and it just dripped out into this big old goblet, right? Um, and that little invention, um, he single-handedly um, spurred a whole industry because those small bottles weren't necessarily a, a major moving product for the liquor industry. But then because of that, and if you go to many restaurants now, they all do that and they have that little hook that it sits in. Um, in some of the brands sell more of those little tiny bottles and they actually do real bot real of the, the large size bottles as a result of that. Um, y con el nopal en la frente is, is a term, my family's from Zacatecas, Mexico and, and Zacatecas, if you know that state is very well known for its nopales or its cactuses, right? Uh, that's why those little cactus graphics in, in the background. And the term y con el nopal en la frente is intentional because it's a term used in my family and anyone I know who wants to express the idea that, hey, you know what, um, you really can't hide from your cultural background. And why would you want to? It's right there uh, with the cactus on the front, which they really mean the nose kind of area. It's, it's right there. You can't um, hide from it. And why would you want to? So I use it as kind of one of my last tags in my um, in, in who I am as as a, an agency. David David Ogilvy is is considered like the king of advertising, right? He started everything. It's Ogilvy on advertising. If you want to know about the ad world, um, you know a lot of the students I teach at San Jose State, I ask him to pick up his book and just read it. He's he's famous for uh, designing what is considered today's advertising approach. Um, what was that TV show that played for a while? Mad Men, right? He, the Mad Men, the, the main character of Mad Men was supposedly designed after him. But one of his quotes that I really like is, you can't bore people into buying your product. You can only interest them in buying it. Um, and that's true. You, you, you have to interest them into what you're offering. Because if you don't, you know, uh, there's a hundred beauty salons down the street. There's a hundred hundreds of nail services down the street, right? Um, and if, if you don't have something really unique to offer, um, I have the opportunity to go wherever I want, right? I can, I can get my haircut anywhere. Um, but there's certain things that might bring a customer back. So let me get into the goal of advertising. First of all, what is the goal of advertising? 
um, anybody have could in the uh, in your uh, in your area there if you want to type in if anybody wants to chime in because it's a it's an open ended question to you guys what is the goal of averaging anybody want to give a shot at it I guess not huh okay well we'll start first thing you want to do in average is you need to create an awareness. I need to know that your product exists because if I don't know it exists, how am I going to even go to your service or to whatever you're selling me, right? If I don't know that um, your salon is there, um, then I, I, I'm not even a, a possibility for you, I'm not even an option, right? I'm not even a potential customer. Um, second step in advertising of the goal of advertising is so you want to try the product or service. So. One of the perfect examples of this is is Costco, right? You walk into Costco and they've got those folks handing you little snippets of food, right? And they say, you want to try it? And, you know, I'm like everyone else. Yeah, if it inter looks interesting to me, I'll try it. So they've accomplished two things. One, I'm looking at the brand. And of course, they're taught to teach you, hey, this um, cheese is uh, a Havarti cheese or this is whatever cheese. Um, uh, honestly, they got me once because I tried a brand of tamales at Costco that I actually kind of liked. Um, and I was surprised because Costco and tamales don't make sense to me, but um, I bought some and um, I liked the brand. I tried the product. Well, by, once I've tried the product, then the next step in the advertising process is purchasing the product. Um, so you go from the awareness step to trying the product to the purchase of the product or service. Uh, and that's huge, um, but you can't stop there, right? Because if I purchase it once and walk away, you, you can't build a business that way. You can't develop a brand that people are loyal to. And that's the next step. You need to create brand loyalty. So. I've probably gone back and bought those half dozen tamales maybe a dozen times so far uh, in the last few years, just because, um, you know, maybe it was just convenient for me. I was already at Costco. They tasted great. They were, they were fine. Um, of course, I don't buy them during Christmas when my family makes their own. I don't need to, but uh, I keep a dozen tamales in the freezer and pull them out whenever I need something in the fridge just to kind of snack on or eat. Um, and so you could say I've become brand loyal. Now that's what is, is taught in advertising. The goal of advertising is to create and whereas try the product, purchase the product, be, create brand loyalty. I like to take it one step further. And I don't want, I want my clients to become brand fanatics, right? Because, and you, you want to think in that vein, I, I believe, because I've got for Milagro, I probably have about six folks out there who I know when something comes up and they're in meetings, they're um, talking about, you know, we need to create a brand here. We need some advertising support. I know that they're gonna go raise their hand. You know, I know this agency, we need to bring them in. Let's talk to them um, because they're fanatics. They're always gonna draw me in. And so I know I can count on six or seven of those folks to bring me um, business all the time. Um, and that's because I've developed a really strong relationship with them. Um, and they believe in the brand that I project. Um, and as such, um, you know, I get someone out there who can help me create an awareness, have folks take a look at my service, you know, uh, purchase this service um, and become brand loyal and, uh, and or brand fanatic, okay? I was David, doing can some- Can I just jump in a second? I don't think your slides are advancing. Oh, so we've been stuck on the same slide? Yes. Oh, geez. Well, <laughs> they're advancing on my computer. Is anybody else seeing the slides change? Well, this is not good. Melina? Vic? Okay, no. let, me do, let me do this. Can no. you see that? Now we're seeing it. Yes. Yay. Okay. You know what? I'll just keep it there, and I'm just going to... Yeah. I'm going to start from the beginning and advance them. That's the one about me. Yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, the, the traditional way is not working, huh? Um, yep. So we'll just, yep. we'll just have so to do this. this is good. One. That's fine. 
why advertising yep. kind of reviewed that right good uh, you know we're cultural content creators i'm sorry guys you missed out on some really cool stuff i know we did um, i just had to go back and look at your presentation and say, oh my god we're missing yeah, all this stuff yeah i'm seeing it on my screen okay so okay uh, um you know again we, we, this is who milagro is yeah um and so for some of you you might recognize some of the characters i use down there frida Kahlo, um you know uh, pancho via um uh, and that little Which character is actually yeah, yeah well this guy is actually our one of our icons uh when i was talking about con el nopal en la frente or the cactus at the front of your head uh, yeah. back to what i mentioned about david ogilvy can't bore people into buying your product you can only interest them and then as i was talking about the goal of yeah. advertising the, you know these all looked really cool because they were all popping up one by one now now i can only go through the slides but that's okay um, uh, and then i was here uh, uh, which uh, I did a little bit of research in the, and there was a Fed study that just came out that was talking about in this pandemic, barbershops, nail salons, and other providers of personal services seem to be the hardest hit. Um, they account for over 100,000 businesses that have closed between March of 2020 and 2021. Um, and I've had three of my clients close because they just got hit just way too hard. Um, and so the pandemic is is such a unique animal. I mean, even the best advertising, I don't know if it's going to, you know, uh, change it. Um, but you you have to just shift your idea, and you can't lose focus on those elements back here that I talked about. Is continually creating awareness, getting people to try your product or service, having them get involved with the service, and creating brand loyalty. Um, in my in the class I teach, I like to talk to the students about Disneyland. And there's uh, and geez, I didn't write the name of the author, but um, there's a book um, that speaks to um, Disney's approach to brand loyalty, right? Um, and th the whole idea of this literature was that, or this writing was that, look, um, places like Disney know what they're doing. Um, because your experience is always the same because they're cast members, remember, they're not employees and they're not whatever else they are called cast members. They're responsible for the brand. So when you walk into Disney, think about it. Hi, how are you? You know, oh, it's your birthday. Let's get you a button. Everybody walking around. Happy birthday. Everybody's got smiles. You very seldom run into people who are going to give you a hard time, right? you it's, it's a wonderful place and they want to keep it that way. Um, they're very consistent with it. They don't deviate very often. Um, and, the, and the whole point of that is that they're creating brand loyalty. This is why we're willing to spend a thousand bucks per family or more, I think nowadays, right, uh, to go into that park. And we've been there before. We've been there multiple times, yet we'll take the kids and our kids will take their kids. And they've kind of keyed in on some amazing brand loyalty um, uh, efforts. It's it's called the experience economy. I remember that was the title of the book. I just can't remember the author at the moment. But the experience economy speaks to the idea that <clears throat> your experience is huge. I mean, we've all been to the retail stores. We've all been to Macy's or Nordstrom's or uh, or wherever. Uh, we've all been to the grocery stores, Gardenas or or whatever store you might be going to, Safeway, and you've all been treated badly at some point in time. <laughs> and when that happens, we don't want anything to do with that store anymore. It's like, you know, you know, and I've had those, you know, I just got back from Safeway and telling my wife one time, and I'm never going back to that store. That teller was just rude. And I wasn't even trying to be rude back. I was just asking a question. Um, people have bad days. That happens. But when you run a business and a small business, it can't happen. You have to. You definitely have to think about the experience that that consumer's having, um, meaning smiles on your faces. Um, Macy's is one of the stores that for many years was doing it right because they took the attitude that the customer is always right. And as such, you could have brought back anything. You know, I remember bringing back a sweatshirt that wasn't, the buttons were falling off and it was old. It was, you know, wasn't, I had, didn't have it for a week. I probably had it for two, three months. And they exchanged it, no questions asked. Uh, they didn't look at me like some stores would have and say, well, you kind of wore this and you know what, it's, uh, it's your wear and tear, sorry, can't help you. 
No, they, they're like, we'll take it back. So if there's any other reading you might want to do, uh, the book is called The Experience Economy. Um, it does focus a good, most of the book on how Disney has successfully um, made us all or made many of us brand loyal, okay? Uh, so back to um, these closures. This is a tough time for sure. But what I wanted to get into um, was a little bit about budgets because most of us small businesses don't, and even I'm guilty of this too. I don't always do this and I should do more of it. Um, but if you're struggling with advertising, you know, a lot of the small businesses that I run into, you know, they say, yeah, we, we, um, uh, the television woman came in and she said, I can get some really good prices. So I spent it and nothing happened. Or, you know, uh, the, the newspaper guy came in and sold me two ads and nothing happened. Nobody came in the door. Possibly yes, possibly no. Um, because you're looking at, a, a, you know, we all want a, an, an immediate ROI. We all want a return on investment. I spent a thousand bucks. I better make 3000. Advertising and marketing just does not work that way. Um, it is more of a long-term commitment. Um, it is constantly looking at it, looking back at it. It does take some time. That's why ad agencies exist with the, with some of these bigger corporations because they don't have time to deal with it, but they don't want to be, spend their money and not get the best return on the product or service that they offer. So this particular slide shows you uh, average marketing budgets by industry. And this was a 2020 report um, and for many of you would probably fall under the retail business, the average percentage of revenue that is spent on advertising right now is 6.93%. And that's 6.93% of your gross income. So if you made a million $100,000 for the year, if you made $500,000 for the year, if you made $300,000 for the year, um, you know, you can look at it and say, well, if I can spend about 7% of that on, on advertising, you have somewhere to start. Most of us don't think like that. Most of us just spend and don't get a return and then get frustrated and then don't want to spend anymore. And then the next time you are spending, you're spending on the fire sale. Oh, we're going out of business. And then you hire me and I go make signs and tell everybody you're going out of business and you sell all your furniture that you have left and you close up that's not when you wanna spend your ad budget. You wanna spend it before any of that even occurs, okay? So if you happen to be in any of these other um, industry segments, I just kind of picked on retail, uh, but that's kind of the national average right now, about 7%. Now, you're gonna know your own business better and know where and when to spend. And you're gonna know when your, your, your highs and lows are. If you own an ice cream shop and, you know, um, winter months are probably not as good as summer months, I mean, that's gonna be an obvious one. Then you ask yourself, do I spend more in this winter to try to get more customers through the door because I already know it's slow? Or do I try to increase my customer base in the summer and spend more right before summer and don't even spend during the, summer, in, during the winter months? Um, but there's no, um, there's no secret uh, or magical wand on this stuff. That's the interesting part of this. There's only, trying to put things together logically so that you can get the best return. And that's where ROI, when I talk to clients, I never can promise return on investment, just not realistic. Um, but what I do promise my clients is a campaign that's gonna be relevant, original and innovative. And my argument with that is if I do that, I have a good shot at helping you, right? Because I'm thinking about your brand and I'm trying to help you get to where you have increased sales and that's ultimately the goal. And if you have increased sales, you have a stronger brand because really that's truly why people think brands are great because they're huge corporations. Apple computers is in, always in the top five largest well-known brands in the world because they sell millions and billions of dollars of product. And they've actually are a good a case to look at too with this experience economy. You know, why do people stand outside in lines when the new product's coming in? You know, why do everybody want the latest iPhone? Why are people willing to spend a thousand bucks on a phone now? I mean, that's ridiculous. We used to spend 150 bucks on a phone, maybe $50 on those old flip phones, right? Um, 
but now it's up to a thousand for this phone that does a lot of cool stuff. Um, so Apple is is a great case study to to search about how to develop a brand. Okay, um, but the budgeting process um, is interesting. Um, and here's the bullets that go along with it. Here's, here's kind of, I was hoping that maybe it's something you can use so that it's not just me ranting and raving about how to you know, manage a brand and have a great brand and all that. Um, but just some simple tools that might be of benefit to you guys. Uh, and really what you got to think about is you need to set a sales goal for the coming year. You want to decide how much to advertise. You want to allocate budget for a time period you want to evaluate the results and you want to do it again and, and you want to have fun with it. If you see it as a chore, it's going to be tough. Uh, but if you see it as kind of a, a part, an integral part of your business that you need to put some time into, um, you can have some level of success with it, okay? Um, and the only way to really set a sales goal for the next year is to review your sales and advertising for the past year or past years. But even if we just took a past year, I'm going to, and in this particular scenario that I want to show you, I've come up with a company called Tortas y Mas Tortas. It's a company I always wanted to open, well, never will. I always just thought it was a cool title. Um, if you don't know what a torta is, a torta is a Mexican sandwich. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. Um, but uh, I just always thought that that would be really cool if it was, you know, I've never seen, well, I have, but I hadn't seen anything in the Bay Area that was just strictly tortas. Because um, you always go into taquerias, right? And we buy tacos, but... Um, I figured tortas y mas tortas would be super cool. But let's just say, let's assume I took a look at how we did last year with tortas y mas tortas. Um, and let's say if you look at um, the left column, Jan I've got January through December, and I just broke down what my gross sales were every month. January I did 150,000. That's probably a lot for a torta place, but whatever. Um, these are all just made up numbers. Uh, February was 60, March was 85, April was 65, May was 95, June was 45, which is kind of low with, compared to these other numbers, right? Um, July was 170, that was a good month. Um, and, I, and I just did the simple calculation of what percentage of the total it was, right? So 150,000 of 1,140, which was the full amount of gross sales, okay? Uh, not my net, but the gross. And I broke it down by percentage. Well. And that helps you because you can look at some of these months and go, wow, June was only 4% of the total budget. That's not a lot. I didn't earn a lot then. And neither was August, right? Um, but then if you look to the right and you also calculate what you've spent on advertising for, for those months, you'll see a correlation, right? In January, I spent $3,600 and down the road, right? Uh, spent 36 k for the year. A lot of us don't calculate that. A lot of us don't even think about it. We just spend it, right? We say, okay, yeah, I'll take that uh, print because uh, La Oferta came in and said, uh, you know, it'd be good. The Metro came in and said, this would be uh, the, the um, we're doing a special on such and such. And so it's a great time for you to advertise. And of course, and then you bought an ad that cost you 1400 bucks. And then the radio station came by and said, hey, be great if you did radio. Or you just did some flyers or you spent some time on your Facebook site, your social media, or you paid Yelp to help you, or you, um, uh, you know, any number of things that you could have done to just get the word out, right? Um, you bought business cards, you put a sign up front, you changed the sign up front, you put your uh, business name on the front of your door, you did some posters, um, anything and everything that you did is advertising, anything you're doing to get the word out. Um, and therefore, if you bring it down, you can see the 100% of your ad budget was 36,000, okay? Um, so why does this really matter? Well, you want to, let me see, why am I not moving here? Okay, oh, there we go. Um, you wanna set a sales goal, okay? The first part was this, which you just wanna kind of lay it out so that you get an idea that makes you understand and look at things logically and say, well, wow, June and August weren't good. And you know your business is better than I would or anybody else would. And you can say, well, th those are always bad months, but why are they bad months? If you're selling ice cream, like we said, well, November, December, January, just, we just don't sell because it's cold and nobody wants to go out for an ice cream cone. Um, and you may have 
low sales and you may not spend those months. That's okay. Um, but if you spread it out, at least you get an idea of where your money is going and then you can make better decisions the following year. Okay. So once you have last year's sales total, which we had 1,140,000, um, then you got to look at a few, things, a few factors. This is what I do with small retails or retail businesses. Um, I'll look at their, a demographic change. Now, you're either going to add or subtract. And this is really from your experience and knowledge of your company. Um, you could do some homework. You could get online and, and look at what, um, for example, if you're downtown San Jose and there's two new skyscrapers going up and there's going to be an influx of about 10,000 new folks living there. Well, you can possibly call that a demographic change, right? Or like I've done all that research and realized, wow, the largest group in the post-millennials is Lat are Latinas. So what does that mean? Well, I can make an internal change. And what do I mean by an internal change? I can add a different product to my mix. If I'm selling tacos, maybe I introduced a different taco. Maybe I haven't been doing a certain type of taco and I'm, uh, I'm asking myself, if I do that, can I generate a little bit more income, okay? And so that's the add column. And then you have the subtract column. Well, there's four more taquerias opening around me. Shoot, I'm gonna lose a little business. So these are really random. I mean, there's, there's it, but it's at least helps you kind of formulate a plan. That's all we're trying to do at the end of this. And so let's say I say, okay, 15,000, I'm gonna probably lose potentially in competition, but I can make some up in internal changes and demographic changes, okay? External factors are just stuff you don't control. So I always just put like 10,000. So I'll add 30,000, but I'm gonna subtract 20, uh, 25,000. So the difference would be 1 million. Um, so I have 1,170,000. I'm back to 1,140,000, I think. I think that math is wrong. Uh, but uh, I'm also going to add inflation. Uh, last year's inflation was 1.25. And this is something small businesses don't do. We don't calculate inflation. Well, inflation is happening with or without you. So if that taco is $3.75, I might want to increase it by 1.25 every year because I've got to account for that. And that can be a positive accounting, actually, if you think about it, not a negative accounting. But if you don't, then we're going to be in the subtract column. In this case, I'm going to, I'm going to account for it. Therefore, I can actually say at 1.25 of the million 140, 14,250 potential income coming in for the following year. Um, brings me to 1,154. And then I'm gonna hustle a little more. This is what I call business ad sales budget as a percentage of line one. 3% uh, increase just because I can go out there and get that business. You've always got to think about that. Uh, so I'm gonna add another 34,000. So now I'm at 1,188 as my goal for next year. These are just goals. You have to set goals. They may be totally wrong. They may be off, but as you do more of this, you get better at it. And again, I'm throwing numbers out there just because I don't know what business we're really talking about, except for this made up one called Tortas y Mas Tortas. But you can plug in numbers that might be a little more realistic to you. Um, but always consider the, the inflation as a reality because it will top and take away from your bottom line. And if you're not making it up, then you're going to be in that negative column all the time. And it will just keep going. 1.25 inflation was actually low because of the pandemic. We're usually around two, 3%, something like that, um, up to 4% inflation. Um, and there are certain things that are going up. I mean, have you gone to uh, Chavez market lately and bought carne asada? I mean, it went up to $16 a pound, I think at one point. I mean, I remember paying 3.95 a pound less than four years ago or five years ago. Um, I think it came down to 11 or $10, $10 a pound. Um, but once you've got those in place, you want to decide how much to advertise. And, you know, I'm going to go with uh, adding 3%. Um, you saw that that number I, I had up there for certain industries was the average is about 7%, right? Um, I don't have that much money to spend. So I'm going to start a little lower. I'm not going to start at 7% of my gross budget to spend on advertising. You're deciding how much to spend on advertising. The average is between one and 15%. You're gonna know what works for you. You're gonna know what doesn't work for you. And you're gonna test and you're gonna play with it. You may spend 15% of your budget and realize 
I'm really not making more. I'm staying about the same. Um, or I've made so much, but I'm not going beyond that. And the next year I, I did increase my sales and I met that sales budget that I had. And maybe I shouldn't spend 15% because I'm actually kind of wasting money. I maybe want to drop back down to seven or eight. It's something that you'll kind of always will move up and down depending on how things are going with your gross sales, okay? Again, we want to add certain things and take things into, into consideration. Um, I'm subtracting 1% because of competition, but I know that I'm going to hustle a little bit, so I'm going to add 2%. Demographic shifts are happening. Uh, more people moving downtown maybe is a, a, a logical reason for my 2%. Um, ultimately, I'm thinking that I'm going to spend 5% of my gross on the budget. Now, look, I'm trying to give you some worksheets that maybe you can work with. Um, but ultimately, you know, you can just sit down and say, I'm gonna spend 6% of my budget. I'm gonna do the national average and go with seven and see what, what happens, right? Um, but you have to, all this really is doing for you is giving you some worksheets to think about so that you spend logically. Because if not, you're just gonna spend as people come at you or you're not gonna spend at all and you're gonna ask yourself, why isn't my business growing? You know, um, There's very few businesses that can stop spending on advertising. One of the, my favorites is uh, I ask my students in my classes. So do you think McDonald's needs to advertise? And what do you think the answer always is? Well, it's no, they're huge. Everybody knows who they are. So then I bring up the reality. Well, okay, so let's give this some thought. Who's their competitors? It's anybody that sells fast food. I mean, not just burgers. I mean, yeah, you'll start with Wendy's and Burger King and the, those and Jack in the Box. They're definitely competitors, uh, but so is Taco Bell. So is every taqueria down the street. Anybody that can get you food quickly, fast, and then in that price point is your competitor. So the minute I stop advertising is the minute that each one of those other businesses who are continuing to advertise are gonna take a little bit from, my, from what I annually earn, even if it's a small percentage. And I know this because one of our clients was uh, early on when I first opened, one of our clients was um, Tecate Beer. And um, Corona was the big dog in the market. They were killing it. They were crushing it in the import category of beer. Now, my agency was hired to promote Tecate um, in a regional sense. We didn't have the national account, but we didn't need that. We did have the regional account, which was basically all of Northern California. And the goal was to take market share from Corona because they were the big dogs. And Corona wasn't spending in this market. They sat back and said, we're good. Everybody knows who we are and we sell like crazy. Well, after we were done with them, we took 2% market share away from them. Now, 2% may seem like a small percentage, but the numbers they're playing with in this market were in the millions of dollars. So we took 2% of their million of dollars away from them and went to Tecate Beer. Um, so advertising is, is key and it'll always be key in competition in whole, or just holding on um, to your market, but it's not everything, right? Because as I mentioned before, like the experience economy, you've really got to provide and look at marketing and advertising, not just from buying ads, but how your internal staff is trained, how they respond, right? Um, you know, when people come to my office and work, interns or anything, I have a certain system that I make them do. They, when they answer the phone in my office, they must say, this, um, this is David Ocampo, um, how may I help you? Uh, or sorry, hi, you've reached Milagro Marketing. This is David Ocampo, how may I help you? And there's three things that are important there. One, they've reached the right place, right? Two, they know exactly who they're talking to. And three, I've immediately told them, I'm here to help. Um, that's huge in just getting people to that brand loyalty. Because how many times have you called the store and it's like, yo, what's up, <laughs> right? And people, I mean, I get that and I'm like, what am I calling to, you know? Um, I had an intern one time who that was, I don't think I had told him, he sat in the desk and he answered my phone and he said, what up? And I just sat him down after he said, um, this isn't your cell phone. 
this isn't your apartment. <laughs> this is a place of business and you will answer the phone this way. And I have these little scripts that I put in their computer screen um, because I think it's important. I think it's, it helps with creating that brand. Um, so you can ultimately start with whatever you want, but then you calculate it, right? You compute that budget because you go by the sales goal. If you say, well, last year I did a million one something, but this year my goal is a million 188, 40,000 increase or something like that, I think is what we're looking at. And you then determine, well, I think I'll spend 5% on budget. Well, there's your number. It's not a rocket science, but it's just putting things into logical perspective. A lot of times we don't have the time for this. So now I'm looking at 59,422. That's my budget spend for the year. That's what I'm gonna to commit to. Um, but then you've got to take it one more step. You've got to allocate that money. And how do you do that? Well, if you go back to the first one, you look at where your, where your holes are and you ask yourself, do I need to increase in June and, and August? Cause I need some, I need this four and 5% to be a little higher to reach that goal. Maybe that's the place. Or, geez, I do great in December, maybe because you're maybe because your product's good for Christmas or the holidays, right? Um, you know, December and January are really good months, right? Um, and so maybe you actually, although you're spending 12 and 13%, maybe you're telling yourself, well, I could always spend 15% or 18% during that time and not spend anything in June and August because that'll never change. You know, but that's gonna be working with this budget and, and just examining it every year to help you get to a point where it's working. But I'm going to tell you this, the reality is it's not going to work day one, <laughs> you know? Um, but like McDonald's, would you rather be creating, stay aware, have your customers keep that awareness of you or have people start to forget about you, you know? Um, so if you allocate it, uh, you can allocate it as a percentage of the gross sales also. So if we knew that January was 13%, and that's, an, that's one of the easiest ways to allocate that 59,000 is to say, well, January 13%, it represents 13% of my gross income. So I'll spend 13% of that ad budget there. So I'll spend 7,725. That's where you can start. And then as you constantly are analyzing your budget, looking back saying, okay, well, this makes sense or no, I'm gonna pull less from here and I'm gonna push up there. Then that June and July, rather than 4%, I might go to 8% because I need more business that, those months, right? And really a lot of times in retail, I guess you could do it in the same month. When you have other things, sometimes you have to lead up to it. You know, like you actually spend more November because you need to start getting people excited about December and January, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and, and so that's kind of creating that budget that, and that, you know, this worksheet, if it helps you guys, I was trying to figure out how to help you a little bit more than just talking about advertising and marketing and all the great things we do. Um, because I know you'll go back and be like, well, that's great that you do it, but I got to go back and figure out my stuff. Um, I can tell you that everything you do is, is the brand. Um, I can tell you that Social media is a great way to get the word out in a very inexpensive way, but it is time consuming. Um, and you can't just put something out and then not put something out on Facebook or on Instagram or on TikTok for nine or 12 months. Um, you need to be consistently there for people to remember, achieve those goals of, oh, wrong one, of creating the awareness, trying the product, having them purchase the product or service and become brand loyal. And if you're Milagro Marketing, create brand fanatics. So um, that's my spiel. I hope this is of help to you guys. And I know that the deck, I'm sure, will get shared, right, Elizabeth? Um, yeah, absolutely. So we will we'll send the deck out to everybody afterwards who's been on the call. So they'll and, have I, it. and obviously, I'm more than happy to answer questions you may have that I just didn't answer in this deck. Um, I think that's what we're OK with, right? Absolutely. And um, I'd love to open it up for questions. And I've got a couple that came in while you were talking. Oh, um, cool. So talk a little bit about, you, you just started to talk about it, but the lag time in, in terms of, Ooh, you know, you're planning your budget for March, but when will, you know, you're, you probably shouldn't expect to see the any increase in March. It'll probably take a well, week or so, right? So well, even, consistency. Even, 
even then the whole the whole idea of this budgeting when you looked at allocating it over the year right. is really that you come back to the year because now you ask yourself it's not that did you meet your sales goal in march it's did you meet the sales goal for the year did right. you increase from that 1 million 40,000 140,000 to 1 million and 80,000 right and and this one's probably the numbers probably aren't so great because i'm saying we'll spend 50,000 to make 40 right, right. um but the idea is that you come back to these every year. You do this yearly as, as an exercise, because if you, if you try to be minutia about it monthly and you say, well, I spent the, that, that's back to the idea that, well, he came in and sold me an ad and I didn't, I didn't right. do anything, right? Well, maybe you created awareness to someone who was interested in what you have, but just not today, just not this week, right? I mean, I may have seen an ad for a, um, you know, for a, a, a hair salon or something that might have been interested to me, but I don't need my haircut this week. I get right. it done once a month, right? Um, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so th that's important that, um, you know, you, d you don't look at it from that perspective because you will be disappointed a lot and then you will stop. Right. right? And then once you stop, then you know i go back to that argument then you'll call me when you're going out of business yeah <laughs> and i'll do the fire sale and that you don't want to spend money then no. what's the point no and okay another question came up um and the question is around you know well what are you going to spend your money on and i i think uh, it would be great to talk a little bit about the you know how do you figure out who your audience is and how do you target I, the way you're going to spend to right so yeah. so you know every um like you know the traditional media and even social media if you've ever been on facebook and bought 25 dollars worth of a facebook ad it will let you click what you want so i produce uh the um dia de los muertos festival downtown san jose every year well, not last year, obviously, and maybe not this year. Who knows? Um, although we're moving in, in the direction of doing it. And we buy a lot of Facebook ads. Um, and, you know, we spend 100 bucks here, $150 there, $200 there. Um, and it's a good place for a festival. Uh, because most people on Facebook are really just kind of hanging out with, with their friends. Facebook frustrates me, everyone, just so you know. Because if you really thought about it logically, these are your friends that Facebook is selling back to you. <laughs> Right, so you could talk to your friends, and they originally started with this super highway where every friend saw every post. But now, if you post, you see that not every friend sees it. Only right. about one to three percent max will see it. So, if you were a business entity and you promoted a sale, and you had a, you know a thousand followers, uh, figure only a hundred people are going to see that ad, right? right? Then, if you want to reach all thousand, then you pay fifty dollars. So, you've established the friends. And yet Facebook is saying, but we'll charge you to reach your friends, right? Uh -huh. So there's a little of irony to me that frustrates me about Facebook, but it has its time and place and it works well for certain things. It doesn't work well for other things. Big corporations like Clorox have said, you know what, we're not even dealing with Facebook because it doesn't work for us. Right? Festivals like me, we love Facebook because we know and we can gauge an audience. We could say, what festival's coming in? Are you thinking about coming? And we get all, you know, all of a sudden, everybody's clicking in saying yes. And what I was getting to earlier is that I can go in and say, okay, I want people in San Jose. I want uh, females, Latinas, because I know the demographic's huge. And I know they're going to drive things. Uh, I want people interested in Latino music. I want people interested in this. And then they, Facebook will go through its algorithms and they'll feed it to all of those people. right? And I can see my numbers jump up. And the well, beautiful part some, of it is you only have to pay for the ones that actually click on it, right? If that's, right. How, you're, if you, yeah. if that's how you're setting up your account. So right. if you can so get when, quite a bang for not too much of a buck. Right. Now, a lot of it is trial and error. So, you know, um, you know, there's certain radio stations I would use that wouldn't really draw in anything. Um, there is Telemundo that I use. There's a billboard, digital billboard I use on 101 that gets a lot of exposure. And so my budget for the festival is maybe $20,000 to promote. And leading up to an event like that, you know, we don't really advertise till three months out. And then we slowly go uh, and we go from there. 
So for your businesses, where do I advertise? Well, one, you need to look at where your budget is. Your budget may allow you enough to buy some radio or TV, right? It may allow you to buy a newspaper. It may allow you to only kind of dabble with um, Facebook and try to build things organically, which takes more time. And what I mean by organically is that, you know, just your friends and everybody helping you and sharing and clicking and, you know, constantly being present there so that people know what you have. Uh, but you can build a good audience that way. Chachos, a large part of what we do for them is content creation for their Facebook site. And I think they have over 20,000 uh, followers. Um, and it's not so much that I feed the info to them. It's that they share it. Because remember, I feed it. I'm not feeding it to 20,000 people. I'm feeding, feeding it to 200 people. <laughs> Right? But those 200 people will say, hey, what do you think? What do you think? Let's go to Chacho's Friday. They have a new drink. They have this new on their menu. I was just there. Next thing you know, that 200 people is really 150,000 people, right? Um, so it is, you know, where do you buy? You have an idea. How do you figure out the demographics? The cool thing with a lot of these radio TV stations is that you can ask them, well, I, you know, this is who I want to reach. I want to reach... 18 to 54 year olds and you can break it down any way you want i want women i want latinos i want vietnamese there's nothing wrong with that that's who your audience is right so you, you one thing you can do to help you um is talk to your customers you know what we call intercepts um i'll give you an example uh i was uh one of my first accounts was the mushroom council of america and the Mushroom Council of America was wondering why when they sell mushrooms in Mexican supermarkets, they weren't selling. And they were asking the question, why do not Mexicans and or Latinos not buy mushrooms? Do they just not grow up with them? Do they not like them? And I introspectively, after having this conversation with them, was like, well, we always had mushrooms in our house as part of certain dishes. Um, so we did a focus group. It was one of the first, well, actually, we did two things. The ad campaign that we were going to roll out was based off this term ongos. Now, if you're a Spanish speaker, you know that ongos truly translated is foot fungus. It's not even mushrooms. <laughs> the, the correct term for mushrooms is um, uh, champiñones, which is kind of which is kind of like the French term too. But but uh, much of Latin America, specifically Mexican, I always talk about Mexico because, you know, 60 some odd percent of the Latino market in the U.S. is of Mexican descent, okay? Um, so they are, are um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm considering this campaign with a creative that, that says, that uses the term ongos. Telemundo and Univision looked at me like I was crazy. So you can't do that. You're going to be selling foot fungus. And that's what the audience <laughs> is going to hear. Um, and I was like, well, let me see if that's true. Fine. I did intercepts in front of Mi Pueblo at the time Mi Pueblo was around. We asked 300 people and it was the simplest survey ever. We had the product there, the mushroom. And they walked in and we said, what do you call this? And 99.9% .9 of the people said, we call them ongos. So when my mom or my abuela or any of them tells me, go to the store and pick up stuff, they're telling me, ve al mercado y tráeme ongos. Go to the market and bring me ongos. Not Champiñones. I think only one person said champiñones, which is the correct term. Don't get me wrong. Right. But I wanted to culturally connect to this audience. Um, we then continued with the quick focus group uh, where we brought in eight or 10 people. We, we talked about mushrooms and their consumption. And two things that came out of the focus group were two things. I don't like buying them packaged. I, you know, and, and so remember the, the US market, we moved mushrooms into the pre-packaged because they're grown in, they're a fungus. They're not even a vegetable. They are considered a fungus, truly. Um, and they are grown in uh, these temperature controlled rooms. I mean, it's a real big science, but yes, they do use, and you know, some of the, um, the, the manures that are used in there to grow it but they're clean, they're the cleanest product you can ever have once it comes out. But we believe that they're dirty, right, in America. And so, you know, Safeways and all of them said, we're not selling mushrooms. So they put packaged them, they cleaned them, packaged them, put plastic over them, and they were selling them that way. And those sell more than 
surtir, which is the Spanish term for kind of just picking at them, what I want. And so we ran commercials and they were real simple ones. It was a code word at the front of the door at grandma's house and you knocked and I used a bunch of characters that were, you know, I had a mariachi, I had a rock and rollero or kind of a rock and roller. I had a, um, a kind of a soap opera star type person and each one knocked at the door and the door would open and they would all say, get ongos or what mushrooms um, in their own style. You know, the mariachi did it, mariachi, get ongos, you know, um, the, the telenovela girl or the soap opera girl, uh, I, I guess back then we can get away with it, probably not today, but she kind of was more of a sexy vixen that came in and said, que hongos, you know, kind of very sexual. Um, we had a little kid, we had the rock and roller, like, hey dude, que hongos, that kind of a thing. And that was it. And then they all sat around grandma's table and she just said, que hongos, verdad? And then we, we followed up with this idea of um, what was your recipe, you know, submit your recipe to us, blah, 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 we'd love to hear about you, that kind of thing, and buy more mushrooms. Um, the Mexican markets were like, wow, we've been selling mushrooms off, off, the, off the table like crazy. And part of it was the research we did by asking these folks about mushrooms was the surtid, and we went back to that. They said, you can't package them. They want to pick the ones and put them in a bag and got, get them. And the Mexican markets weren't doing that anymore. Yeah. They had moved away to the package stuff because everybody else, Safeway, was doing that, right? So they went back to that and then they were flying off the shelves. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm going a long way to answer this question. Um, what I'm trying to get at is that ask your current customers. Simple question like, what do you call these? Helped us with what we call in the industry insights. I'm always looking for an insight that gives you that, oh, whoa. The other actually insight that came out of that focus group was this gentleman who talked about in his hometown in Mexico, he, they would make portobello sandwiches, tortas, portobello tortas during Quaresma or during Lent every Friday. Oh. And that was their substitute for meat. So we ran the campaign during Lent to promote mushrooms during that time. And that was part of the whole success, calling the mongos, getting the validation that that was okay running the ad campaign during Lent. And in fact, I remember the, um, it's been many years, but I remember the, the recipes, you know, during Lent, what is your favorite mushroom recipe, right? Um, and the fact that people wanted to sortia or sortir, sorry, um, they wanted to pick their own and moving away from packaging in the Mexican right. market. Um, all of those were just came from some real basic questions. So I'm not saying some of your business have the capability of running big focus groups, but a focus group is as simple as, your customers at the register are, hey, where do you where do you hear about us? Oh, I heard you on the radio. Cool. Well, or, or what's radio? What what where do you get? What, what do you watch? And what are the shows you watch? What TV stations? What radio stations do you watch? And if you ask every customer, you'd know where you can increase your your budget. You can say, oh, everybody's on Telemundo. I think I'll stay there. Or you know what? I'm advertising on Telemundo, but everybody's on Univision, and I didn't want to do Univision because it's more expensive. Telemundo is a little cheaper. Well, <clears throat> it may be worth spending a little and having a little less, right, on that station because you may get an, an increase in customer base, you know? David, Next another time. question just came up uh, that I think you'll probably be able to handle beautifully. How can a small business identify the right marketing <clears throat> company to work with? Mm. Well, look at their website like mine and you ask yourself, is that is the style and what I see on their website look um, relevant to what I do? Do I like their style? You, you have to trust this company because the company is going to be playing with $50,000 or $20,000 or even $10,000, you know, or even $5,000. You know, to, to all of us, right, that's hard earned money and it's hard to let it go to someone else and to let go of some reins because you're not the expert in the field, right? So, one, their website, two, call them and just ask for a, a, a quick meeting. Um, they're gonna ask you a few things, I can tell you this. The larger agencies are gonna say stuff like, oh, well, how many salons do you have? <laughs> and I know so many of them base them on, well, if, if a business has at least three locations a re in, when it comes to retail, a lot of the agencies are say, okay, they have budget to really do something because they can pull from three. If they have one store, they may be a little more hesitant because they're gonna think, well, he's gonna, be trying to advertise with a really small budget. And, and many times it may be that you're better off spending your money 
for yourself and experimenting using this kind of this this um, sheets that I gave you. Um, and to be honest, everything is on the web. I mean, you can pull up. How do I create an ad budget? What's how do I spend? You know, you can uh, you can keyword. I you know beauty salon best way to advertise to Vietnamese market, <laughs> right? And you're gonna get the answers. And so then you, it's a little bit of research. That's kind of what we do. Um, you know, of course we do a little more cause we're trying to match the demographic to the media, all of that kind of stuff. And then to the budget and just really trying to see what we can do to help. Um, but you don't, you can't discount things like if you are a neighborhood retail location next door, you can buy some advertisements on next door. And next door is huge right now. You know, you can go in there and we've used next door for a few clients uh, for some political campaigns and we've had some pretty good results with it, you know? Um, but realize who's doing, you know, you, you know, I can tell you, Facebook is a, is a 35, 40 plus location right now. Okay. Um, the, the younger generations on Instagram, right? The 20, 18, 20 year olds to 35 year olds are on Instagram. That's where or they TikTok. live. <laughs> well, TikTok's still younger and TikTok's a yeah. little tougher because TikTok really appeals to like a really young audience right now. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, like a preteens, you know, right. eight to 15 year olds. And they're a tough audience to advertise to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but TikTok is the new thing. What I do suggest you do is you, you need to get your, the emails of all of your customers and you create an yeah. email database and you yeah. communicate through newsletters. It may seem archaic, but I can tell you, Facebook will not be here forever. Facebook will be gone in 10 or 15 years. If you don't believe me, do you, do you have a MySpace account? And if you did, <laughs> can you get it? Does anybody go there? Probably not. Um, Facebook will be MySpace and it's already, people are leaving Facebook in droves. They're getting tired of it. Yeah, many have moved to Instagram. And then the young kids don't want to be where the folks are at. My kids do not want to be on Facebook because they don't want to see my stuff and they don't want me to see their stuff. Um, so you've got to think about your audience, you know, who comes in. If you have a product that is all generations, then use them all. If you know that your audience is older, and those are all simple questions you can ask. Um, you know, uh, you can you can do a, a giveaway. Could you fill these three questions out? A lot of people don't like to do that. So it almost is putting it on your salespeople or your tellers or whoever you've got to sit there and go, hey, can I ask you three questions, you know, while they're, while they're going through the line? Um, you got to figure out a way to get their information. Um, hey, you know, we, we're going to give away um, uh, two months of free haircuts. Can we get your business card? Uh, you know, and you put their email in that database because once Facebook's gone, you've spent all your time building your customer base and they're gone. But if you have an email that's good, that works, you can always email them coupons or you can, you know, uh, BOGOs, you know, uh, buy one, get one free. Or you can always email them that, hey, we're still here. Love to see you. You know, simple as that. Don't be afraid to, to reach out to these people and just say, we're still here. Then you don't always have to have a sale or a product. Just reminding me is enough sometimes it's like oh that's right i forgot about those guys you know what um shoot i'll go there again and that, that you know just think about how you operate there's always that one place that you like but you get so busy with everything else you forget they don't advertise and then the next thing you know you drive by and you go oh you know what i love that barbecue place why don't i go there more often I should go there next week pick something up had i received an email saying hey we're still here cooking up some great barbecue, I might have gone quicker or sooner. Who knows? Hmm. Okay, well, how about another one or two questions? And then I think we'll have to let David go and, and, and do some creative advertising. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Anybody want to put something in the Q&A or the chat or just unmute yourself and, and ask a question? Nope, looks like we may have answered all the questions. That's pretty impressive, Dave. <laughs> okay, well, I hope there was value in this for all of you. Um, you know, got to so kind of guinea, I got to guinea pig this a little because I am trying to put together a retail advertising, I told Elizabeth, a retail advertising uh, uh, lecture for my students as well. Right. 
great. Well, we really appreciate it. And if there are any other questions that come up uh, for the audience afterwards, please don't hesitate. Uh, you can email the, um, the, the email address you'll see down at the lower left-hand corner of the screen, COVID-19 SJBusiness at sanjoseca.gov. Or you can call our hotline number that we have in multiple languages capabilities of answering, 408-535-8181. And I'm going to turn it over to Melina to wish us all farewell and, and good night. Oops. If Melina is still with us, scrambling <laughs> to get herself unmuted. Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth and David. Um, we do invite everyone to uh, tune in to the next webinar on, um, what is that, August uh, 15th, um, August 19th on um, state budget updates. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.